Cool. Anyone else hiring for Python? Or, I'm sorry, anyone else looking for a Python position? Yep. Don't forget afterwards, if you're shy, don't worry. There'll be people standing on this side of the room, and you can just go find them. We, we like this community. We want you to get a job and keep doing it. Great. So I'm going to um, introduce our speaker who doesn't need to be introduced. I don't think anyone here does not know who our speaker is tonight. So um, two things. You wouldn't be here at all if the whole let's start this language didn't happen. And also um, an ongoing work, even though a lot of people are involved in Python all the time and it's a community effort, you need one person to be that focusing force, uh, someone benevolent. Uh, <laughs> so a benevolent dictator is an awesome speaker to have. Um, I, thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for actually coming to speak to us. I, I want to say just one thing really quickly, is that there were people who had always remembered our group from ages ago. And the one thing they remembered is, wow, you would see a new person asking a very beginning question and the person who wrote the language would actually be right there answering the question for them. And that's been true forever. And uh, I, I don't think we could be any more thankful than that. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Can everybody hear me? I hear a slight echo. Echo. And I need to, that is not at all what I wanted to show, of course. <laughs> Dang it. Switch to mirrors before. That is also not what I wanted to show, but uh, if you really want to, I'll talk about exploring Google APIs with Python, but maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe Wesley can give me some hints about that. I, I do want to ask Wesley, did you actually found Bay Piggies? No, that was Deirdre. Oh, that's right. And it's this really small cafe, yes, exactly. or the internet cafe. Or exactly, and most people were standing outside the door. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that too. Okay, so maybe I can start the, the sort of regular part of the show tonight. Uh, <clears throat> I've actually got three parts sort of prepared with, with more or less levels of preparation. Uh, the first thing is, is a very personal uh, speech I'd like to, to give so you can hear a bit more about my beginnings. Uh, the second part is more technical. I'm actually uh, hoping to get you all excited about Python 3.6. I know many of you are still on 2.6, but 3.6 is the future. And then uh, it's, it's Q&A until they kick us out of the building. Uh, so let me see if I can get this thing to work. Because I'm just going to uh, read this. <coughs> yes, that's how I want it. So uh, last April, the Netherlands celebrated King's Day. And I really don't mind if you read it, but I'm... I'm it's a very, very personal thing for me, apart from the, the, from the King's Day thing, which is actually not my thing. So anyway, to honor the tradition, the Dutch Embassy in San Francisco invited me to give a TED talk. And, and we talked on the phone first, and it took me forever before I understood what she wanted. Uh, but finally, when the, once the email came, I realized that I had signed up to give a TED talk, whatever that is. Uh, so this is what I read. Uh, part of this is the sort of the short version of my autobiography and, and really don't encourage me to write a long version because it would just be very boring. But the short version, I think, is, is useful and interesting. Uh, I have a bit of philosophy about why programming languages are interesting and important and, and sort of, well, that's, that's a little bit of a tautology coming from me, but I still care about it. And then part of it is specifically about Python's big idea. And because I'm going to pretend that I'm giving the speech again to this audience of Dutch and American entrepreneurs, I will say, Leve de Koning, long live the king. Because that's how you say, are supposed to say that. So uh, excuse my ramblings. I'll, I will get to a point eventually. But let me introduce myself first. I'm a nerd, a geek, and proud of it. I'm somewhere on the autistic spectrum, 
and I'm a pretty late bloomer. I graduated from college when I was 26. I think it took me seven years or so to get to graduation. I was 45 when I uh, finally got married to the love of my life. I'm now 60. Uh, yeah, I'm still 60. <laughs> it's, not that it's not that long ago that I wrote this. And my son is 14. Well, actually, in, in two months, he'll, he'll be 15. And he's going to be taller than me, that's for sure. So maybe I just have a hard time with decisions, because I've lived in the US for 20 years or more. And I'm still a permanent resident. I, I can't be bothered to fill out the paperwork for a citizenship <laughs> application. Also, depending on the outcome of the next election, I might uh, <laughs> change my mind completely. <laughs> so I'm not Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, the New York Times has never heard of me. But when I was 35, I created a programming language. And it got a bit of a following. And you're all here to show that. And what happened next was, was pretty amazing for me. And, and I'll get to that, because first, I want to go really back far to the beginning. So, but when I was about 10, my parents gave me an, an electronics kit, a very educational thing. It was made by Philips, and it was actually pretty amazing. Apparently, they, they had nothing like that in the US. There were other kits, he Heathkit or Radio Shack. This, this was really much better, somehow. And in the beginning, I just followed the directions, and everything worked. It was, was a little bit like Lego for me in that way. And later, I figured out how to design my own circuits. Uh, but in the beginning, I owned three transistors. <laughs> That's not even enough to make one bit of memory. <laughs> Although, actually, if you add a few capacitors, you can do it. <clears throat> so I played with that a lot. <clears throat> uh, and my first, the first model I built, just sort of from, from one of the schematics in the kit, was a blinking light. And I don't actually think at the time I really understood completely how it worked. But it did work. And it was a pretty cool thing for me. So I took it for, to show and tell in fifth grade. And that, that was like the first time I realized, or looking back, I realized that was the first time I was confronted with my nerdness. Because nobody cared or understood why that was interesting or important. Uh, so that, that was sort of, I imagine many of you have somewhat similar memories, uh, even if you've repressed them. <laughs> so in high school, I got nerdier. I hung out with the other nerdy kids who were also uh, building electronics. And we exchanged ideas and schematics and sort of tips for what components to buy that were only 10 cents instead of 25. <clears throat> and in physics class, I remember the three of us just sat in the back of the class discussing uh, NAND gates, and the rest of the class was following the lesson about Ohm's law. And normally, that's pretty annoying when you have a couple of kids in the back that just don't pay attention at all. But our physics teacher actually figured us out. I still have such incredibly fond memories of that guy. And he actually employed us, the, the three sort of electronics nerds in the class, to build a digital timer. And the way I remember it, I was the genius who figured out how to design it, and we built it together. Uh, who knows? It was probably just from a, from a magazine. But we built it, and it worked. And it could measure times up to, I think, 10 milliseconds. Uh, tied to the f grid frequency of the European ele electricity grid, which is 50 hertz instead of 60. <laughs> <coughs> Otherwise, I don't know what we would have had to do. So anyway, it sort of, as a project, it was great. It was successful. Uh, we realized that the, those nerdy skills were also somewhat useful. The other kids still thought we were weird. Uh, this was in the 70s, and everybody was into smoking pot and sort of rebelling against, uh, well, whatever there was to rebel against. <laughs> Mostly their parents, I suspect. And then there was another group at the same school who were already preparing for their successful careers as doctors and lawyers and tech managers. Uh, but the two groups left each other alone, and I still graduated. And I was actually one of the best of my class, and, and not just in the sciences. 
so after that, I went to University of Amsterdam, which was like the only choice I ever seriously considered. It was close to home, and it was in Amsterdam, which was like the only cool city. <coughs> so my, my physics teacher was actually surprised because I decided to major in math, not in physics. Uh, but in the end, I don't think it mattered one bit, uh, because here's what happened. In the basement of the science building, and actually I think it was mostly, mostly the mathematics building, uh, they had a mainframe computer, and that was love at first sight. There were card punch machines and line printers and batch jobs, and it, it, so it took like forever to see the errors from the compiler because you had to sort of wait for the operator to run your job and sort the output. And <clears throat> it was a lot of fun. Somehow, yeah, that, that sort of, it's unbelievable. When my son hears me about this, he just starts glazing over and says, <laughs> Dad! <laughs> but I, I learned to program in, in several languages, things like Elgol and Fortran and Pascal that are mostly forgotten now. But at the time, they were very highly influential. And there I was again at the back of class, uh, the topic that the professor was talking about was a little more advanced, but I was still ignoring the, the lecture and correcting my computer programs so that uh, during break I could start another run and get the output after the next class. <laughs> so why was this? Why was this so exciting? And I realized that it, it wasn't just the interaction with the computer. There was There was... Something else that was amazing was happening. There was this loosely knit group of students and staff with somehow the same interests. And we were talking. We were exchanging the tricks of the trade. We were sharing subroutines and programs. Uh, we actually sort of, there was this little underground fight with management of the mainframe. Uh, <laughs> eventually, I, I, I turned sides, but. Initially, I was very, very much sort of on, on the underground side. Uh, disk space was, was the big thing. Disk space was something you actually had to pay for. And it was the, the Department of Mathematics that paid for my disk space. And once I got in serious trouble with the professor over that. And it was like, it was probably like a megabyte of data. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so incredibly precious, you cannot imagine. But... The most important lesson was not about disk space, it was about sharing. The programming tricks I learned sort of died with the mainframe era, and, and every mainframe was different anyway. But the idea of sharing software, that software needs to be shared, is a very strong idea. And it's called open source, and it's a movement. And so I want you to hold that thought, and of course you all know that. <coughs> so at the time, the immediate knowledge I had of the tricks of the trade seemed to matter the most because the mainframe operating system group actually employed a few part-time students and they posted a vacancy and I applied and I sort of, after a half hour interview, they offered me the job on the spot. So that was a life-changing event and not just because my dad suddenly didn't have to uh, send me money every month anymore. Suddenly, I had unlimited access to the mainframe. There was no more fighting for space or terminals. And also, I could actually, I had access to the source code for the operating system, which was very much not open source. And the, ex the access was pretty limited because you had to find the right binder and look up the, the right subroutine on, on a certain page. But there was some kind of indexing software that printed out an index, and every week or every month we got new printouts. So that was my dream, d dream job. Oh yeah, I also had, there were other people showing me stuff. That was also sort of, again, the cool part. So I was prog programming all day. There were real customers because what I, the, the code I wrote was actually sort of integrated into the operating system as utilities for all the users of the mainframe to use. Uh, of course, it was too exciting and I basically dropped out of college and I would not have graduated except my manager was actually pretty enlightened. And there was one professor who hadn't given up on me, and uh, they nudged me a little bit, 
and I got some study points for all the work I had done while working there. And I think the professor pulled some strings, and everybody was happy to see me gone, and <laughs> I graduated. <laughs> so, surprise, surprise, graduation also meant that I suddenly was eligible for a new dream job, another dream job that just sort of fell in my lap. Uh, and without that degree, there would have been no way for, for that particular place to employ me because it was a research lab and the only kind of people they uh, employed were uh, people with degrees. <laughs> so I had never lost my interest in programming languages. And so the team I joined in my, my dream job was building a new programming language. And that is, even today, that's not something you encounter that much. How many of you work on a team that is building a programming language or even building a compiler? <coughs> Not even one person? <laughs> there you go. <coughs> so hopefully the idea was that the new language we were building was going to replace BASIC. Uh, well. It was the 80s, and BASIC was the language of choice for the new generation of uh, amateur programmers who were using microcomputers, not mainframes, like the Apple II and Commodore 64. And to this day, I don't actually know what the latter one looks like, but we had an Apple II sitting next to the mainframe, <laughs> and so I, I got to choose <coughs> previously. So now our team thought that BASIC was sort of a pest that the world should be rid of. Uh, apparently, that's still everybody's opinion, and like cockroaches, it still hasn't happened. But we were, we were building something called ABC, and the motto was Stamp Out Basic. But, well, sadly, for reasons I, I cannot completely explain, the marketing sucked, or maybe the timing sucked, and, or maybe the language sucked. After four years, the project was abandoned, and I've, I've sort of... After that, I was still gainfully employed, and I was busy doing other things, but I also had some time to grieve the, the sort of the demise of ABC, and, and I thought about it, because I thought that the, sort of the language had so clearly was, was doing the right thing, wanted to do the right thing. And so, well, I don't know, my view at the moment is that apart from being somewhat over-engineered, my best answer is that ABC died because there was no internet in those days. And because of that, there was no feedback loop between users and makers of the language. So the design was a one-way street. We built this language, and it took us years to build it, and then we hoped that we would somehow find users. And we found a very small number of users, and whenever the users said, well, we wish that it was different, there was, like, there was no decent channel that they could give us that feedback, and we would probably have, if, if it had reached us, we would probably have said, well, you're wrong because this is why we designed it this way, and your way would be worse. And they're, they're sort of... But there wasn't a whole lot of that feedback possible. It would, it would, it would just like take a year to, to, to process feedback into a new version of the language, if, even if we were set up for that. And, and after sort of some very early user explorations where it was just uh, one person with a whiteboard, or probably a blackboard in those days, and one user discussing things, there, there was just no possibility like that. So, well, half a decade later, when I was picking through ABC's ashes, looking for ideas for my own language, the missing feedback loop was one of the things that I decided to improve upon. So, release early, release often became my motto, sort of after the Chicago Democrats' encouragement, vote early, vote often. <laughs> and... By this time, it was the early 90s, there was an internet, and it was small and slow, but it was still incredibly much different. So now I look back 25 years, and the internet and the open source movement or free software really did change everything. Well, 
everything in my life anyway. <clears throat> and there was something called Moore's Law. So together, these have entirely changed the interaction between the makers and users of computer software. And it's my belief that these developments and how I managed to make good use of them have contributed more to the success of my programming language than necessarily my programming skills and my experience at that time, because I think I had been programming for over 15 years when I started Python, no matter how awesome my skills were. So, to be honest, it didn't hurt that I named my language Python. That was sort of completely unwitting marketing genius. <laughs> I just meant to honor Monty Python's Flying Circus, and back in 1990, I didn't have much to lose, I thought. So now, if, if you sort of, if you want to name a new produ product, you can hire a brand research company and they'll charge you a very large fee to tell you exactly what associations your name tickles in the subconscious of your potential customer. But I was just being flippant. <laughs> so remember, this is uh, my speech on King's Day, I've promised the ambassador not to bore you with technical discussions of the merits of different programming languages. But I would like to say a few things about what programming languages mean to the people who use them. Programmers. Typically, when you ask a programmer to explain to a layperson what a programming language is, they will just say, well, a programming language is how you tell a computer what to do. But if that was really all, why would programmers be so passionate about the languages when they talk to each other. So, in my opinion, in reality, programming languages are how programmers express and communicate ideas. And the audience for those ideas is other programmers, not just the computers. The reason is that actually the computer can take care of itself. No matter how poorly you design a language, you can still write a compiler for it and the computer will execute your programs just fine. <clears throat> but programmers are always working with other programmers, and poorly communicated can cause expensive flops. You've all heard the stories about feet versus meters and other interesting uh, <clears throat> commu expensive communication mistakes. In fact, ideas expressed in a programming language also often reach the end users of the program, the people who will never read or even know about the program, but who are nevertheless affected by it. Think of the incredible success of companies like Google or Facebook. Uh, at the core of these companies are ideas about, ideas about what computers can do for people. And they are very different ideas, and computer, computers can do both, of course. To be effective, an idea must be expressed as a computer program using a programming language. We, we don't know any other way to make a computer run. The language that is best to express an idea will give the team that uses that language a key advantage because it gives the team members clarity about the idea or the ideas. So, for example, the ideas underlying Google and Facebook couldn't be more different. And indeed, the company's favorite programming languages are pretty much at opposite ends of the spectrum of programming language design. Google, C++, like it or not. Facebook, PHP, like it or not. <laughs> well, tell, tell, I don't know how many billion Facebook users that. So. I don't like it either. <laughs> but this, this is my point. The ideas in the languages somehow connect. So here's a true story. The first version of Google was actually written in Python, uh, probably before they even called it Google. The reason was that Python was the right language to express the original ideas that Larry Page and Sergey Brin had about how to index the web and organize search results. And using Python, they could run those ideas. Anyway, in 1990, long before Google and Facebook, I made my own programming language and I named it Python. But what is the idea of Python? Why is Python so successful? How does Python distinguish itself from other programming languages? And, and why are you all staring at me like that? <laughs> so I have many answers, some quite technical some from my specific skills and experience at the time. 
It's a long time ago. Some just about being in the right place at the right time. It was definitely a certain amount of luck was involved. But I believe that the most important idea is, and I don't know why Word decided to give this a green underline, <laughs> Python is developed on the internet entirely in the open by a community of volunteers, not amateurs, who feel passion and ownership. And that is the same as what that group of geeks in the basement of the science building really was all about, a community. So here's the surprise, like any good inspirational peach, speech, the point of the talk is about happiness. I am happiest when I feel that I'm part of such a community. And I'm lucky I can feel it in my day job too, as a principal engineer at Dropbox. And yes, we're hiring. <laughs> And we use a damn lot of Python. <laughs> anyway, if I can't feel it, I don't feel alive. And so it is for the other community members. And that feeling, that feeling of happiness that is caused somehow by, by owning and sharing software, that's contagious. And we have members in our community really all over the world. So the Python user community is formed of millions of people who consciously use Python and love using it. They're active member organizations, sorry, they're active members organizing Python conferences known as PyCons in faraway places like Namibia, Iran, Iraq, even Ohio. <laughs> and the guys in Ohio are so glad I mentioned that. <laughs> Although the, the woman in Iraq was also uh, pretty happy. So here's another favorite story. A year ago, I spent 20 minutes on a video conference call with a classroom full of faculty and staff at Babylon University in southern Iraq. I was answering questions about Python. <clears throat> and thanks to the efforts of the audacious woman who organized this event in a war-ridden country, students at Babylon University are now being taught introductory programming classes using Python. And so life goes on even there. I still tear up, tear up when I think about the power of that experience. And in my wildest dreams, I never expected I touched lives so far away and so different from my own. So on that note, I'd like to leave you a programming language created by a community fosters happiness in the users around the world. And next year, I might go to PyCon Cuba. <laughs> Thank you all, and if we have more time, which I think we do, uh, I would like to talk about a completely different topic, what's new in Python 3.6, and it's probably completely irrelevant for your day job, because you're probably still using Python 2.7. Uh, so am I in my day job. <laughs> And it's fine. I have a cunning plan. <laughs> so this talk is not about Python 2.7 or why there's no 2.8 or why 2020 is an absolute hard deadline for everyone to be off the, or what you can do if after 2020 you're still using Python 2 because I think Red Hat uh, is happy to sell you a service contract at that point. And it's going to be a damn good service contract for both parties. But in the meantime, last week, Python 3.6 Beta 1 was released. And if you want to know when the final 3.6 comes out, read the release schedule. Uh, by the way, these days, if you just Google for PEP and a three-digit number, the first hit is almost always the Python uh, enhancement proposal by that number. So. That's why I never give URLs for PEPs anymore. So we're going to have betas 2, 3, and 4, about three or four weeks apart. Hopefully, you all have some idea what to expect from, from betas. A beta is pretty good, but it's probably got some bugs. And the higher the number of the beta, the closer it is to the final version. What we'll do in December, we're, we're aiming, we're shooting for a final release of 3.6.0 on December 16. That's a very hard schedule because after that, everybody disappears on uh, their 
holiday travels. <coughs> uh, to make that, we have a release candidate in early December. If we really find anything seriously wrong with that release candidate, we do a second release candidate, I think a week later. And then it's 360, like it or not. And so one important deadline for the 36 beta 1 release was actually beta 1 means feature freeze. And so the week before that release, we were actually very lucky. We had a sprint with 15 core Python developers in one room, which never happens. Even at PyCon, they're all sort of distracted by other users, and the sprints are after the main conference, so everybody's already tired. This time, we had nothing to do except Sprint, and we were lucky that Instagram and Facebook and Microsoft and the PSF uh, and various people's employers actually sponsored their travel. Uh, the PSF sponsored the travel for the people who had to come the farthest, actually, <coughs> which is really amazing. <coughs> so, in one week, we committed more code than normally, sorry, we committed as much code as normally gets committed in seven or more weeks. That, that one week, the week before beta one, more code was committed than the previous seven weeks together. And I think that it's, it's been an abs the absolute record week in terms of commits, basically since, since the beginning of Python, since as, as far as our uh, logs go back. So, I want everybody to try out uh, 3.6 beta 1 because if nobody tries out the betas, there's no point in having betas. We might as well just go straight ahead with a uh, final release or just wait three months and then do the final release. But we really want people to try these betas. So we really also work hard to make sure that the betas sort of aren't too buggy. Well, there was... There was one issue that slipped through. There's always a few, but you got to work pretty hard before you hit that issue. So anyway, what is new in this uh, 3.6? Well, <clears throat> there's actually, in, in a Python release these years, there is way too much new stuff to list all of it. There is way too much stuff to even know all of it. We do have a what's new doc, and it actually looks much more complete than it looked two weeks ago, but it's still very incomplete. Uh, I just want to share a few of the highlights that I think are interesting for a wide audience or things that I personally uh, care about. If you have any other thing that you think, well, did we solve this thing in 3.6 yet? Did you get rid of the gill yet? Uh, <laughs> that's what the Q&A about it. I, I really, I'm really am this time. I am hoping for that question because the, I have a new answer. <laughs> <laughs> so this one came to a surprise to as a surprise for me, and actually, I think, to many people at the sprint. But it turns out that the Gen Japanese guy named Inada Naoki, I have no idea why he capitalizes the Na Inada, but he does. <laughs> and we respect that. And nobody has ever met him, but he is an amazing, super cool coder. And he wrote a compact re-implementation of dictionaries. And dictionaries are pretty much the most core data structure in the C Python interpreter and the most complex data structure. And it became slightly more complex without becoming any slower. But it now has two amazing properties. It saves 25% space compared to the previous implementation. So all your dictionaries use up a quarter less space, which is amazing. And it preserves insertion order. If you add three keys to a dictionary, and then you iterate over the keys of the dictionary, you'll get them back in that order and not in the order of the hash table. So it's, the hash table is still essential to the implementation, but no longer in your face when you're using it. And it turns out that just in the past few months, we had accepted two PEPs that requested that certain 
in certain situations, it was so important to preserve the order of things that we said, well, an implementation has to use an order dict or some other approach to ensure that the original order can be retrieved. And the first one of those is keyword arguments. There are a few cases where it's really important to, to sort of somehow be able to tell the difference between a keyword arguments are given in this order versus that order when you pull all, out all those keyword arguments as a star star dict. And we now have that. And so we had already accepted a PEP, and or the original idea of the PEP was that in that particular case, we would have to use an order dict. Now the standard dictionary implementation already supplies that, bingo. And the other one was similar for the definition order of class attributes. Uh, there are a couple of important use cases where it's interesting to know in which order the fields of this class were actually defined. Like when you use a class definition to, say, create some kind of database schema because the order of your columns matters. Or if you use, Django has a forms feature where uh, field definitions in a class uh, specify the user interface for a form. And it's also often important to specify in which order those, those fields appear in the user interface. So Django, Django has some horrible hack. But a future version of Django or a new framework that, that is living in the Python 3.6 or later world doesn't have to do anything special. If you just iterate over the under under dict of the class object, you'll get all the fields in the right order. Uh, and again, <coughs> you pay nothing. You get 25% 20, free. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And so I should also uh, thank core committer Victor Stinner, who was at the sprint, who reviewed all that code and then finally uh, sort of vouched for it and committed it. Another thing that is very user visible and some people will hate because it sort of violates there's only one way to do it, and other people will love it because it's finally the right way to do it, <laughs> format strings. So here's an example print statement, and there's a string literal. It says hello, curly brace name, curly brace closing, and then some more punctuation. And this substitutes a local variable, which was defined on the previous line. And the, re the way it works is you have an F prefix for that string literal. And the F stands for format, and it's, it's sort of, it follows the same pattern as how do you distinguish bytes from regular strings, a B prefix, prefix. Regular expressions, an R prefix. Well, okay, the R means raw, but it really meant for regular expressions, not for Windows path names. <laughs> uh, let's see. <clears throat> so this also happens to be the shortest thing. Uh, and it's actually more powerful than, than the example here because you can actually put an arbitrary expression between the curly braces uh, as long as it doesn't contain backslashes or, or other quotes. Uh, don't overuse that, but that's always an, an implicit recommendation with any new feature. If you go crazy and use your feature 10 times on every line of code, you can feel really cool and no one else will like your code. Just <laughs> use it, use it when, when the need arises. <clears throat> this thing, uh, I don't know, I thought I'd throw it in because just there are way more Python users on Windows than will admit to it. <laughs> uh, Windows, in the sort of the, the Windows API world, there is this unpleasantness where every API exists in two forms. One that takes uh, old style character strings, which in Python you really would call bytes. They're, they're one byte per character. And then there is the, the wide APIs, uh, which use two bytes per character, and they are actually encoded in, uh, in Unicode. The problem with the one byte API is that the encoding is not standard. The encoding is named MBCS. I don't even know what it stands for. Uh, 
but it's not actually an encoding. Like, if you say UTF-8, if you ask two different programs to encode something using UTF-8, they'll get the same answer. If you ask two different programs to encode something with MBCS, they'll get different answers depending on some preference that the user specified when they sort of booted up the machine first time after they bought it. There's a way to change that setting too, but nobody ever does that except enterprise sysadmins. <coughs> so the one byte APIs are really unpleasant and inconvenient and, and sort of evil but they've also been around forever, and so we, we had a considerable hemming and hawing about, well, can we change this? How much code will break? But finally, Steve Dower, who is uh, an incredibly smart Python coder uh, and works for Microsoft and, and sort of has made all things Python better at Microsoft, actually. The interaction between Python and Microsoft has gotten so much better since he started there a few years ago. So he finally convinced us that in the Python world, when you use Windows APIs, or sometimes it's just file system APIs like open or rename or lister, if you specify bytes, in the past that was interpreted as MBCS, and who knows where you got those bytes from. If you got them from some other Windows API, you were probably fine. If you read them from a file, who knows what the encoding in the file had been. So basically, you're stuck with, well, it's probably an ASCII superset, so if I stick to just ASCII, I'm going to be probably safe. And anything else is like, well, la, la, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> uh, we are now finally changing this to if you pass bytes to something that is a wrapper around a Windows API. It's always going to interpret those bytes as uh, UTF-8. If it's not valid UTF-8, uh, it's going to balk at you. Uh, and then it's going to convert that UTF-8 to a two-byte Unicode using surrogates if necessary, if you're using one of the higher planes. Uh, and then it's going to use the modern uh, so-called wide Windows APIs, which make everything more predictable and sort of there's no longer a worry that at some point Microsoft will, <coughs> will sort of actually get rid of the narrow APIs rather than just threatening to. Uh, <coughs> so if you're either talking to the console using console-specific APIs or using, the, depending on the file system encoding anywhere in your Python program on Windows, uh, beware that it's going to be uh, UTF-8 now. So what else is changing? Well, we have underscores in numeric literals, so you can now say PEP5 underscore 1 underscore 5, and that's PEP515. Uh, again, if you overdo this, uh, <laughs> Nobody will like you, but there are, if I actually have to write a 10-digit number, or I have to read it especially, I really appreciate being able to gr see the groups of thousands. So if you put underscores between every group of three digits, and you sort of, if you want your number to be more readable, you can do it. Uh, so that's a nice little win. Uh, there's a secrets module. The module itself is not secret, to the opposite. Uh, this is a small collection of APIs for working with crypto stuff that is very simple to use. It is secure. It uses the, 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 the right random number generator that's also usually based on U random. Uh, and it, it generates sort of crypto quality random numbers rather than using the random generator, which is faster, but the, the random numbers are meant for simulations, not for cryptography. <coughs> so if you're, if you're sort of picking a secret key to uh, en encrypt a connection, you should never use the random module, and you should use the secrets module. Uh, there is also a, a few things for for sort of choosing random, random passwords or getting the random number is uh, a hex string and uh, a few others. Uh, <clears throat> it's 
not a super complicated module. I think there, there has maybe less than 10 APIs in it at the moment. But it's easy to remember if you have anything that requires secure crypto, use the secrets module, not whatever other things people might have recommended. Okay, now we get into the territory of things that are probably of little interest, but that have spurred an enormous amount of debate relative to the importance of the issue. One of these was the file system path protocol. Uh, in Python 3, 4, I believe, we introduced a new library called Pathlib, uh, which is a sort of a more object-oriented way to deal with uh, file system paths. And it hasn't gotten a lot of uptake, and there was a long discussion on why people weren't using Pathlib. And it sort of, one of the reasons was that it's actually difficult to take a path and sort of recognize that it is a path and then turn it into a string that you can, can send to a file system operation. And there is now a protocol, and I don't know how much of the standard library actually uses this protocol yet, but uh, you gotta read PEP 519. There is now a standard that will make it very easy for various library authors to accept path libs, lib objects without any uh, complication of their code. The sort of probably the most, uh, most hotly debated thing ever was whether you random should block or not when there is not enough randomness in the system. And one of the reasons of the, for the debate is that nobody could actually point to an authoritative source that even said that this was a problem. There were like, oh yeah, well, everybody was, had heard of this bug, and if you then finally track down the issue, it was a completely different language and a different situation, and it was completely unclear that Python code could ever be executing that early in, uh, <coughs> in, in the boot sequence of a Linux system. And of course, the, the problem is entirely Linux specific, so people who are not using Linux couldn't care less, uh, except they didn't want their code to be polluted with sort of cargo cult defensive programming around the possibility that the OSU random could perhaps block. Well, there, were, were two, there was like, Huge debate when 3.5.2 had to be released because there was like the, the system random initialize, initialization could also potentially block and it was all tied together. And I finally got so tired of it that I picked a random answer and said, that's what we're gonna do for 3.5.2. And then everybody went on and was mad at me and two competing peps were written and debated again I, I had to unsubscribe from the mailing list for a while too. <laughs> it got too emotional. And yeah, the people at Red Hat are still really unhappy because they lost. <laughs> that's, that's how they see it. Like I announced that, I, that I, I had picked the other pep and they turned around and said, well, we're going to, we're gonna ignore that and or sort of we're, we're gonna patch Py, uh, Python 3.6 beta one when it comes out to our systems to work our way and log the data and see if any users actually run into this. Well, maybe they'll find something. Uh, but if, if you want to have the absolute winner of the single bit that got most debated, it must have been, it must be the fold bit that we added to the daytime object. Uh, that's actually a really cool pep. Uh, it has to do with an ambiguity in the representation of time, one hour per year, when you set the clock back, when the daylight savings time ends. And so the way the clock is represented, you say that the clock, the, 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 a day, sort of the system clock, of course, just counts virtual seconds since the epoch. 
and it says, well, you have to calculate what your local time looks like because the, the system clock is always UTC. So the system clock has no ambiguity and no problem. The problem comes with a day time object which does not represent time internally like the system clock. The Python's day time object actually records, well, this is the year, this is the month, that's the day, that's the hour, this is a 24 hour clock at least. That's the minutes, that's the seconds. And if you want to sort of translate that to a different time zone or say what, what date is it a thousand hours later, you can do all sorts of operations on that, of, on that. And there are time zone info objects that you can pass around to represent your local time zone or somebody else's local time zone. <clears throat> it sort of, it doesn't, it doesn't, look at your local time zone anywhere, you always have to say, this is my time zone description. And time zones can be pretty weird if you sort of are into these things. But the problem remains that if you have a day time and all it says is it, it's like 2.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning in November, I don't know, November 2nd this year or something like that, then if you say, well, translate that back to uh, the POSIX UTC timestamp, there are two possible answers. Because the local clock really did have the exact same setting to an hour apart. And nobody ever cares about this. <laughs> and there is a reason they do it Sunday morning, because everybody who's still up is too drunk to, uh, <laughs> to care. <laughs> And this is also why uh, banks are not open over uh, <laughs> the weekend, usually. <laughs> and yet some people care. <laughs> and, well, we decided on an incredibly backwards compatible hack where there is one bit that gets added that basically never means anything. The, the, the only time that bit has a meaning is when you are in that ambiguous time. Well, there are a few other places when you are in an impossible time because when you move the clock forward in spring, you have the opposite problem where there is a, there's something that you, your local clock will never say that particular day. <laughs> and if you, if you see a clock that did say it, then the question is, was, was that really, should you add an hour or should you subtract an hour, basically? Uh, <clears throat> So anyway, I just thought it was fun to, to mention that, that the most debated bit ever. <laughs> and if, if, if you have a candidate for, for one that is uh, better, I'd like to hear about it. <laughs> oh yeah, leap seconds would be another complication, but we happily ignore those. <laughs> uh, so async stuff, uh, the async, I think the last time I was, no, not the last time, but the time before last I was here, I talked about async IO, which was then a new library that I had just been working on nonstop for probably six months at that time. Uh, that's now in the past, async IO is successful. Uh, in 3.6, we're finally actually turning off the provisional bit on the PEP, <coughs> which means the one of the async IO co-developers is very sad about that because he he sort of, when he has, has a good idea, he wants it implemented right now. <laughs> he actually did another record winning thing uh, that the, the third bullet here was a PEP that was, the, the PEP was submitted for the first time a week before the code freeze, for the, before the feature freeze. But it was such a small thing and I was in a good mood. <laughs> uh, so we have async comprehensions, which doesn't make any sense until you've, you've sort of lived in the async dev world for a while. So in Python 3.4, we added async IO, and to wait for an event, you would have to say yield from, and then an expression that returns a future or a coroutine. Uh, that was 
a nice backwards compatible hack because the yield from statement had been added for sort of unrelated reasons in the previous Python version. Uh, but it was a little verbose, and not everybody sort of understood instantly what yield from actually means, uh, because it really meant something completely different. Uh, and so we came up with this fairly elegant hack in Python 3.5, where if you, you can define a coroutine function by putting the keyword async in front of the dev keyword. Uh, and then inside that function, you can use the, a new await keyword, uh, which, which means the same as uh, yield from, but in a sort of more understandable fashion. And it's, you could say it's a very small thing. On the other hand, once, once you've sort of migrated to this world, reading code that says async def and uses await, is really a step up in clarity from the previous uh, pound co at, at coroutine decorator and uh, yield from. It sort of, it is much clearer what happens, plus it's more or less the same way you would write it in C sharp, uh, if anybody cares. <coughs> so anyway, if, if, if you followed that, uh, it turns out that people who have, who sort of have gotten used enough to the async def await syntax, eventually they're going to want to write asynchronous generators. They're going to want to write something that is an async def, but it also yields a sequence of values using yield something at different points. And my Code example here is more sort of a hint on what this is about rather than actual syntax. Uh, if you haven't used async def, this seems a mind-boggling esoteric thing. On the other hand, once you've started using async IO, then you can start using async def and await. Once that feels natural, I mean, it takes a while to get used to, but suddenly, at some point, it suddenly becomes the right way to do things. And then you start using it more and more, and then at some point you do actually realize, oh, I wish I could write a generator that, that sort of you iterate over using uh, a wait, or, or using an async for loop, actually. Uh, and using 3.5, you would have to suddenly go back to defining a class that has a dunder iter and a dunder next method, uh, and what would be a three-line generator with the async uh, and await in the right spot suddenly becomes a 20-line class definition. Uh, <coughs> the async comprehensions are really just a cherry on top. Uh, they, they were something that was relatively easily enabled by the async generators. So if you're not into async IO, you probably couldn't care less, but if you are, I would recommend check it out and realize how cool that is. Finally, the thing that I fought hardest for, variable annotations. Some people want to call them variable declarations. If I say variable declarations, everybody starts yelling at me and comes up with pitchforks and all those things. Because nobody wants to see variable declarations in their Python code. Except people who are already using MyPy. At Dropbox, uh, and this is not really a secret, although the blog about this hasn't come out yet it's gonna die because I haven't written it yet. But in two weeks' time, I think, uh, we're going to have a tech blog post from Dropbox about how we're using MyPy uh, to make our code more readable. And we actually have over 250,000 lines of annotated code. So that's not 250,000 annotations, but it's sort of the, 
the combined function bodies of the code of functions that have annotations in their header is over 250,000 lines. And this is roughly equally divided between our client and our server uh, code, which are both in Python. So anyway, if you are using MyPy and type annotations, so if you're basically already a PEP 484 convert, you'll find that occasionally the type checker cannot figure out the type of a variable and it sort of gets stumped and it just tells you need type declaration here or need type annotation. And using PEP 484, there is actually a way to add a type annotation to a variable, but it has to be spelled using a comment. Uh, now given that PEP 484, at least the Python 3 version, uh, uses actual syntax that appears in the AST, it's very unfortunate that the type comments are also part, an essential part of your code once you, you are done annotating it. And I'm not sort of, I'm not motivating this very well because I wasn't planning to give a whole talk about this topic. Uh, but I can assure you that these two examples looked much uglier and harder to understand using the type, the type comment syntax in uh, PEP484. Because you basically just have to say A is none and then a comment that says pound type colon and then a list of int. And for B, the same thing, but the empty list as the initializer. Uh, <coughs> This would seem a small thing, but it turns out that, again, it is one of those controversial things where people, people somehow believe that because the language is going to allow variable annotations, that some people, and, and, and the, the, the worry is always about sort of evil, evil uh, engineering managers, no, I've never met one myself, so I don't know if they exist outside the Dilbert comics. <laughs> but the fear is always that evil engineering managers are instantly going to mandate all our Python code needs to look like Java. And thou shalt put type annotations, variable declarations on every variable. And that's not how it's meant. And that's not, <laughs> I assure you, that's not how we use it at Dropbox either. We put as few type comments in as we can. We, we only annotate functions and methods, which is the PEP 484 way, except in those cases where the type checker needs a little extra help, and the type checker being a, a computer program that, that has a limited understanding of all the clever hacks that uh, Dropbox genera job dro generations, I should say, of Dropbox engineers have come up with. Dropbox started in 2008, and some of our code is about that old. And some of our hacks look like the hacks were even old in 2008, but nevertheless, those hacks are in the code. And it's sort of when you execute it, somehow magically it does the right thing. But when a human tries to understand it, you probably cannot figure out what it does without pointing a debugger at it and walk, stepping through it and seeing, oh, wait, ah, that thing is a function, not an integer or something like that. There's always some sort of aha moment where you realize that the code does not do at all what you thought it was doing based on just looking at the code. And those are the things that type checkers also have trouble with. And when the type checker really has trouble with it, sort of it asks, please help me out, put an annotation here. And sometimes actually you should see that as a, a subtle hint that you should probably refactor your code to be a little bit, bit better to understand. And sometimes you just have to admit, well, yeah, the type checker cannot know everything and we just have to tell it what's going on here, and then you end up adding a few type comments left and right. And the idea is that type comments 
do not, because type comments do not live in the abstract syntax tree that the parser sees or the AST module sees, the tools that work with the source code also have a hard time seeing the type comments. On the other hand, syntax like this shows up in the abstract, abstract syntax tree, even if it doesn't show up in the bytecode, because the, this, this code doesn't actually have any runtime effect when you execute it, or almost none. <coughs> It certainly doesn't, doesn't do any type checking. That's the sort of the basic idea. The type checking is still done offline by, say, MyPy or an IDE like PyCharm. Uh, but the type annotations are in the code, in the syntax, so that any tool that uses Python standard AST module can actually find them. And the hope is that at some point in the future, Python 3.9 or so, we can tell people stop using the type comments, use the annotation syntax, and all the tools can uh, be happier. But of course, that will take time. So this is a very forward-looking PEP, and I really don't blame you if at this point uh, you're asleep. <laughs> but please wake up and uh, there's supposed to be a microphone. Oh, it's, it's right there, Glenn has it. And yes. uh, if you have a question, please uh, queue up. I, I heard there might be a question about this version of Python in a gill, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Well, so Larry Hastings, bless his soul, has, has made it his life's mission to remove the gill. Man's <laughs> he is, but but... Sometimes insanity needs to be rewarded. He certainly has good branding. He, uh, he calls it the galectomy. <laughs> so it's removing the gill. And every time I meet him, I say, so Larry, when, when are you going to get rid of the gill? And he says, ah, Guido, I removed it last April. The problem is to get the speed back. Because the, the, the way he removes the gill is very straightforward. He just puts locks on all other data structures. <laughs> and every program runs 20 times slower. And all the effort that he is putting in at, at PyCon, and again during the core dev sprint, and I'm sure in his uh, copious spare time, is working on clever hacks to gain the speed back that you lose by removing the gill. Uh, and he's, he's always very optimistic, and he has, he has this incredibly complicated, but also, in some sense, beautiful system for doing reference counting, where the reference counts are separated from the object, and they're actually queued up, and there's a separate thread that is, that is the only thing that can decrement the reference counts. And so objects may get deleted a little later than you expect, but they will eventually get deleted. And then, the, well, there's always another wrinkle. And before you know it, there is like an input queue and an output queue for every live thread, and it just gets more complicated, but somehow also more efficient. So he's still working on that. And his sort of, the, the latest wrinkle that he mentioned to me was actually, uh, Unfortunately, a pretty bad one, which is that even if he, if he gets all the speed back and, and, and then some, uh, the C API for extension modules has to change because every extension module that manipulates Python objects can no longer assume that while it is running, if it is not doing an operation that obviously allows other Python code to run, it is the only thing in the whole world that, that is sort of looking at these objects. Once there's no gill, your C extension may be manipulating objects that are shared with another thread, and another C extension, or Python itself, might also be mutating those objects. And so everything you thought you knew about that object you may have a list and you may have decided that list is empty and so I'm going to append something to it. Well, guess what? Someone else might have made the same observation as doing the same thing and now 
At the end, you each believe that you have a list of length one in your hands, but actually the length is two. That's not the end of the world, but sometimes it goes the other way around, and you both try to delete the last item from the list or something similar. So anyway, the, the end is not yet in sight, and unfortunately 3.6 and 3.7 and 3.8 and 3.9 will all be released with a gill in it, because that's the only way we can support extension modules. And extension modules are actually a damn important reason why Python exists, and also why CPython is still dominant. So, <clears throat> Larry, Larry is not entirely sure of this yet. My, my own idea for the branding would be that if we're actually, once, once we're, we're ready to release this new Python without a gill, that's what we would call Python 4. But until then, it's uh, just Larry's hobby named Galactomy. And now there's a real question. Um, I have two questions. You said that usually type annotations almost, type annotations almost never have an effect on the bytecode. It sounds like there's an interesting story there. And then the second question is, would a type checker ever be part of the Python executable? The second one? It's very unlikely that type checking will ever be such an integral part of the language for everyone. It, it really is quite a separate thing that should only happen when you, when you compile code. And it, it should, I think it should always be separate, just like a linter is a very important tool and you should never integrate a linter with your interpreter. So I feel the same way about the type checker. Maybe in Python 5 we'll, we'll do something different. But So your first question, what, when does a type annotation or variable annotation, let me go back a slide, when does it actually affect the runtime? Well, the first thing is that actually that list square bracket int or stir thing gets evaluated. The second thing is that at least when we're talking about a global variable or uh, something at a class level, which could either be a class variable or a declaration of an instance variable, the annotation is also stored. And uh, if you're familiar with how PEP 484 stores annotations, actually that's a, a much older PEP 3107, I believe, function signature annotations. The annotations are stored in a dictionary named under under annotations under under on the function object. And so if you have a class that contains any of these things, uh, the class will also have a under annotations object. If you don't create any of, if you don't have any of these syntactically, the class will also not have a under annotations object. And there's, there's a special interface you have to use to even inspect those Dunder annotations because you have to be careful with superclasses and all that stuff. Ditto for globals. Uh, so if you have global variable declarations, you can actually have a global Dunder annotations that collects all the annotations. However, that's, that's all that happens. With those annotations, once they've been collected in Dunder annotations, the C, C Python interpreter does nothing with them. You can inspect them if you want to, but that's it. The final thing is when this, is, this happens on a local variable, we made an exception for speed and we said, well, we're, we're going to check that that thing is syntactically correct because it has to be able to, we have to store it in the AST, but we're not actually going to execute it. And sort of that's a compromise, I mean, on the one hand, I like the idea that these things are executed just so to keep you honest and make sure that list and int have actually been imported or they're built-ins. On the other hand, when it's for locals, you would be evaluating them on every function call and that may not be desirable. And we considered other things like, oh, when it's a local variable, it's only, it's evaluated at function definition time. And then the question is, well, that's a strange time to evaluate something that could occur in the middle of a function. 
and what if the sort of the type definition depends on a type? The, the, what, what if the annotation depends on a definition that was made on the previous line also in the function? So we decided to just punt on that. Cool, but thank, thank you. No, no runtime type checking, and you're welcome. So uh, I think you know a lot of people here like me, first time see you in real, in real life. So it's a very, very exciting. Hello. Very exciting, yeah. So I have two questions. One dumb question, the other probably a little bit open question. The dumb question, if our entire intellectual property is in purely in Python, what is the best way to encoding or encryption? Because except for compared to other languages like C or C++ or some trivial abstraction packages, what is the best way to fully protect our intellectual property in Python? That's a dumb question. But uh, yeah, my second question is, uh, nowadays a lot of people use Python either for big data, as big data science the de facto language, or for DevOps, so in cloud computing. So in your mind, uh, what is the load map or your idea in my, make Python even better? It's, it's very good, but better in terms of like uh, big data friendly, Cloud native friendly, microservice orientation friendly. Giving you examples, uh, the most successful Python project, as far as I know, is OpenStack. Several million line of project. But uh, if you would like to re uh, invent or re write your Python, if you envisioned like uh, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, there will be a project like uh, OpenStack, which use a lot of functional concurrency you know, timing sensitive or synchronous type of, you know, cool, fancy features. What are you gonna do, you know, for, for, for that kind of situation? Oh man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start with the first one, which is that you probably shouldn't worry about that. You, it, it sort of, it, it's actually an interesting thing that, that Dropbox encountered long ago. And at the time, Dropbox actually put some effort in obfuscation of the, the bytecode. So be, you, I think your, your main concern is that because Python translates to bytecode and bytecode is so high level, uh, there are several very good decompilers that take the bytecode and uh, regenerate the source code, and they can recover everything, even the doc strings from the bytecode, not the comments, but the function names, class names, everything. Uh, and what to do about that? Well, I would say the sort of, if you're worried about that a little bit, don't worry at all because that's not how your company is going to go under or lose, lose any kind of battle. Uh, don't sort of, don't worry too much about your competition, for example, figuring out what your code does by decompiling the bytecode. Your competition can probably figure out how to, how your code works just by reading your end user documentation or uh, buying a copy of the, the application and figuring out how it works. Yeah, this is only for non-open source business model type of company. If it's open source... If, it, if it's open source, uh, your, your, your intellectual property is, is open and, and then you shouldn't worry at all, of course. <laughs> I was going to say, if you seriously worry about people sort of figuring out how your code works and breaking into it, writing your code in Java or C++ isn't gonna protect you either because the best hackers in the world are very good at sort of figuring out what your machine code is doing better than you are and they can, they can speed up your code and attack it at the same time. <laughs> So that you don't, you don't know that the attack is there because your code runs just as well as before. <laughs> uh, your second question, what, what would I do Make different? Yeah, yeah, different. Uh, if I... 
Yeah. Uh, that I, I, I don't know. My, my best answer to that is actually sort of Python is made by a community. The, the people who, who have needs in, in an area where I am not an expert can, can, can join the Python community. Sorry? Well, I, I try to listen to the users, but I sort of, I don't, I do, I'm not an expert in every field myself. And, and like every few years, I, I maybe pick a new hobby. And, and so five years ago, I would never have expected I would make something like AsyncIO. Because I, I had heard of Twisted, and all I knew about Twisted was that none of the users liked it, but the developers <laughs> were really smart. And then somehow there was, there was this random event that happens where someone said, oh, there's this really old piece of code in the library that tries to do asynchronous stuff using an event loop, and it's terrible. Can we not improve it a little bit? And somehow I, I saw that as a prompt to say, well, let's improve it a lot. And before I knew it, I, I was talking to the, the, the Twisted developers and the Tornado developers and trying to, to sort of pick their brains on how, how their systems were built and what all the, all the tricks were. And I was, was making AsyncIO with their help. And a few years later, when that project was sort of not finished but but mature enough that other people could could sort of take it over i got interested in this type checking for python thing which had been a sort of a very latent hobby of mine since about 99 or 2000 i i i swear i i i found a talk i gave in early 2000 with a couple of syntax proposals that never made it that looked just like pep 484 <laughs> and it's sort of, I, I just had that in the back of my mind for a long time until, again, a random event where someone said, hey, for my PhD, I'm working on this language that is not entirely unlike Python. Uh, can I bounce some ideas off, off you? And we ended up working together on that. And so I really don't know what my hobby is going to be two years or five years from now, and it might something like concurrency in a large distributed system. On the other hand, I've worked for companies doing those things for over a decade now, and I still feel that I don't know all that much about how these systems at, at that scale really work. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm, I'm, I feel like there are other experts in the company who, who understand that stuff viscerally in a way that I don't. But who knows, I might, I might at, at some point pick their brains and, and Python 3.7 will, will have something better in that area. But that sort of, it, it has to come from, from users. The sort of people have to bring me ideas. And, and, and then I will try to actually listen. Hi, Guido. Um, Hi. Just going back to your initial talk, what were the, uh, some of the principles that you learned from developing ABC and perhaps programming on the mainframes that you chose to um, build a Python around? The well, per, so perhaps the most prominent feature that Python borrowed from ABC is actually the use of indentation for statement grouping. That was literally like that in ABC. Uh, every little detail of it was the same in ABC as it is in Python. Uh, and I, w I had never encountered that idea before I joined the ABC team. Uh, and I don't know, it, it sort of it makes Python stand out, and some people hate Python for it, but a lot of people actually love Python because of the extra clarity that that it shows. Uh, 
an important principle of the ABC team was actually to think like a user. So while they did not have a feedback loop with users implemented, they certainly sort of, there was a small group of users who were also the developers of ABC, but we were very consciously sort of taking off our language designer hat and putting on our language user hat when we were discussing the design of features. And I think where we failed was that we were just too small a sample of users and we were also not the kind of users that we actually had in mind for ABC because ABC was meant sort of, it was aimed at users who were non-professional, not sort of not computer science educated people. Uh, and of course, everyone who was working on ABC's implementation had 15 or more years of uh, programming experience in the industry. So we had a hard time understanding how, how our target users thought. And I think that was one of the things where we, we missed. But we, we sort of did sort of, the, the, there was a lot of previous experience with t teaching less perfect programming languages to that tar kind of target demographic where uh, users had trouble understanding the limitations of computers like, oh, when I add two integers, why is sometimes the result smaller than the inputs? Well, yes, that's because our particular mainframe only uses 27 bits to represent a number. And if your numbers are larger than, I don't know, a couple million, uh, they will silently be truncated when you multiply them or add them. And ABC was very carefully designed to avoid traps like that. And like, there were, no, there were supposed to be no limits. Like, you could write a program that was as long as you wanted, and you could make the lines of your program as long as you wanted. You, didn't, you weren't limited by the 80 characters that old punch cards uh, used, for example. But your data structures had the same thing. You could have a string that was megabytes in size as long as it fit in, in main memory. That was sort of, the rule was always, you can use as much memory as, as you have on your computer. And if you use that for a million, a list with a million things in it or a single thing that is a million bytes in size, that's up to you. You can't have them both perhaps, but the language or the implementation of the language shouldn't stop you from making large strings just because that was an un, unanticipated use case. Like, I think in Pascal, strings couldn't be larger than 255 bytes in some well-known implementation. Uh, the, the idea that there should be a small number of data types that can be combined in many different ways to, to sort of produce many different interesting data structures also came straight from ABC. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank you and the community for the work on Python. You're welcome. Um, also, um, I'm a little bit curious about uh, the experience with uh, type annotation at Dropbox. Can you tell us a bit more about this? Also, you told us that you were working on Python 2 at uh, Dropbox. So do you use like type annotation on Python 2 code or like Python 3? Uh, yes, we... You, we use uh, Python 2 and we put the annotations in comments. And actually, when PEP 484 first came out, I think it was a year and a half ago now, uh, it only supported Python 3 using function annotation syntax. And then one day, some people at Dropbox said, but we really want to use MyPy on uh, Python 2 at Dropbox. And uh, they designed a way to translate the function annotations into comments that actually made sense. Uh, and that was first implemented uh, during a Dropbox hack week. 
And then we tried it, and we liked it, and we sort of tweaked it a little bit, and then we made an update to the PEP. So now that's actually, there's a section on how to do it in Python 2, essentially, in PEP 484, that shows the syntax we use at Dropbox. Uh, well, if you want to, the long version of this story, come back in December, because the Bay Piggies talk in December is given by three of my, two or three of my colleagues uh, who've been working on the MyPy project for uh, over a year now. Uh, I will be also uh, coming there. Uh, and we'll, we'll sort of tell you a lot about how, how MyPy is working out for us. The short version is that we did a small amount of promotion internally and uh, Dropbox engineers who tried annotations consistently said that they liked it, they wanted to do it more. Uh, one project uh, over the summer decided that they would mandate type annotations for all new or modified code. Uh, that project now has, I think, 140,000 lines of annotated code out of half a million. Uh, other projects combined have another 140,000 lines of uh, annotated code. So we've, we've done two user surveys so far internally at Dropbox, and both times we got excellent scores in terms of user satisfaction. They like the notation, they like working with it, they like the effect that it has on their code, how they sort of improve the readability and accessibility of the code for other engineers. They like how it helps them uh, feel more confident when they refactor large amounts of code. Uh, they also like sort of how the tool works. It's not too slow. Uh, it's pretty good, it doesn't crash very often. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's like, it started out as someone's PhD project. Most of those things don't work at all. <laughs> so, we worked hard on it to, to make it better, and sort of we also get, got very high scores for uh, sort of the support, the, the MyPy team, which is two or three people at Dropbox, the support we give to the whole Dropbox engineering organization whenever they run into a MyPy question or a crash or just a mysterious error message, they go on an internal Slack channel and we help them out very quickly. Now, the amazing thing is that MyPy is open source, uh, and every improvement we make to MyPy goes instantly back in the GitHub repo for MyPy. So if you all are using MyPy, you also benefit from all the care and love and attention that the MyPy team gives to the, the Dropbox engineering team. So I'm, I'm very grateful, in a sense, that, that Dropbox is so generous in letting us do all this as an open source project. And we have, like, we have most of our design discussions, all of our bug triage is in the public tracker on GitHub. So that's our experience, and we're pretty happy with it, and we hope that... Uh, Everyone else will give it a try. And so it really does work for Python 2 as well as for Python 3. And my secret hope is that it will actually help you migrate to Python 3, because moving to Python 3 is one giant refactor. And one of the things that MyPy, sort of annotating your code and then running MyPy, helps you with is refactoring in confidence. So it will help you transition to, my, to Python 3. Thank you. My pleasure. So thank you so much for making a, a language that's spread all over the world. People all over the world in a million different languages use it. So when are we going to see in Zen of Python something that says it should be as easy to write an internationalized program as a non-internationalized one? <laughs> and do you see anything on the horizon 
to replace things like get text and um, there are actually some more language things but aren't in the standard library that really help with internationalization. Oh man, internationalization is such a <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like async. It's a hard. pool of mud. <laughs> it's 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 really difficult. But Almost so was async. Hmm? But so was async. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Uh, maybe internationalization ought to become my next hobby. <laughs> It's really tricky. Well, but we've sort of... Some people believe that during the, the, the discussion about the format strings, the F strings, mm -hmm. there was quite a bit of discussion that was trying to also make this provide superior support for internationalization. Well, I know we discussed many years back of being able to put a random character in front of the strings and having a hook, using that as a hook. But I don't know if that came back. A random character. In other words, you could put a T, and then you could have some dunder someplace that picked that up and translated yeah. your strings before it got passed on. You have but Pearl in your past life. <laughs> I, I see Pearl 6 in your future. In Pearl 6, you can you design your own string with quotes. the U on the strings. Eventually, you caved. <laughs> okay. Okay. So nothing on the horizon now for internationalization that, you, that, that is on the visible Horizon. Not, not, nothing that I'm particularly aware of. Okay. Sorry. Well, thank you. Okay. Oh, hey, um, just I have a. Qu so the memory management in Python sucks, and uh, are you planning to do something about it? <laughs> <laughs> ah, well, th thanks for the constructive criticism. <laughs> There, there are actually a few core devs who uh, care about this a lot. One of the things that didn't make it to my slides, but that you can find in the... Actually, two things that you can find in the what's new. One is there is an environment variable that you can turn on to get various malloc diagnostics out of Python, which will help... help and, and I should really sort of just look up in my editor. Python malloc allows setting Python memory allocators and or install debug hooks. Uh, that seems pretty low level, but apparently you can uh, get much more insight in how the memory allocation machinery is performing in a particular case. Uh, I would also mention, uh, where is it? Okay, I should just really do this on the internet. Ah, I have no idea what these things are, but I hear that DTrace and system tap also allows a variety of inter interesting low-level uh, probes to happen. So is there a high-level kind of way to control the memory in Python? Uh, yeah, you have to write your code differently. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and, and, and I'm sorry, it's a high-level language. It uses a lot of objects, and they, they have sort of arbitrary lifetimes. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, I have a, um, two quick, very related questions. One is, um, if time goes back, what is the one thing or a couple of things that you would have done differently? Maybe something that uh, is now very hard to change or something that you would have loved to have in Python that is in other languages and, and so on. And the uh, I, I don't have a lot of sort of language feature envy of other languages. The, the, the biggest thing that I probably would have done differently if I had appreciated at the time what the effect would be is actually the way the transition to Python 3 was planned. <laughs> the sort of 
10 years ago when we started thinking about Python 3, I think I severely underestimated how successful Python already was, how many people had written so much code in Python 2 that it would be hard for them to pay attention to sort of put the effort in to translate it to Python 3. I thought that giving them a tool that did 80% of the work would save them so much that they would happily do the final 20% because the sort of the smaller projects that I was looking at myself didn't look like that final 20% was all that much work. I had not appreciated how many people already had enormous code bases or were on their way to building up enormous code bases, that sort of. So I, I was too humble. I thought Python is not all that successful, so we can easily sort of make all these changes to make it better and drop backwards compatibility. And I wish, I really wish that we had sort of thought more about what the transition would really look like for, for people who already had millions of lines of code, which really is, is a mind-bogglingly large amount of code. Try to print that. Yeah, <laughs> all right. And the, uh, the one related to it is, what is the one, mean, one or two things that you strategically think or would love to add uh, to Python someday and maybe not the foreseeable future, but at, at some point? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that is like, I, I hate essay questions. <laughs> I give, give me a multiple choice any time. I sort of, I, I, it is my weakness, but, and I sort of, I turn it into an advantage by telling the users it's your language. Sort of go, go give me, give me ideas. That's, that's how I work, and, and that's how Python sort of gets better. Not by sort of adding, I mean, every release, there is somebody who says, oh, this pep is going to be the killer feature. <laughs> and if you, if you have like, if you look five years later, the, the, the best thing of that release Nobody even knew that that, that was a relevant change. <laughs> and the thing that somebody thought was going to be the killer feature needed three more releases before it was usable. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it's hard to, to predict what your language really needs. And I, I don't want to make any apologies. Sort of Python would not be where it is now if I hadn't made all the decisions and that includes all the bad ones because there's there's no way to to only make the right choices and and sort of i would just have been stymied i i, I tell this story every time but you know how make files have this annoying tab character <laughs> so the, the 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 anecdote about that is make came out of bell labs like in very early unix days unix maybe even in the Unix six times. And a colleague of, of the Make's author, I forget who it, who it is. <clears throat> maybe someone can Google that. Who, who was the original author of Make? Anyway, one of his colleagues at Bell Lab said, that tab character is really annoying. Can't you change that to some more visible syntax? And the author said, yes, I agree, but I already have a dozen of users inside AT&T, and I, it's too late to change. <laughs> I, I want to make the right decisions given the development stage. And so actually going forward, change is going to be more slowly and, and limited to backwards compatible corners. And, and yeah. Everything that is the way it is, we just have to live with it. And, and you can't go back. You can't put the toothpaste back into the, tooth, into the tube. <laughs> OK, some people might say this is apples and oranges. but uh, And don't get me wrong, I like Bash. 
Um, but would you like to see a feature where, like, your default uh, terminal and Red Hat or any distribution came up as Python? Uh, no, I would, I would personally not use it. It's a sort of a shell is a different thing than a programming language. And I, I don't want to sort of blend the two together. On the other hand, I think that for scientists who are doing data manipulation, something like IPython is amazing, but sort of IPython works in a very different environment than your, your console shell. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to see the two remain separate. Um, you mentioned that um, going to Python 3 is a huge refactor. A lot of people out there consider 6, um, the package 6, to be a panacea. Um, I personally don't like it. Do you want to speak to that effect? Uh, well, the guy who made it, Benjamin Peterson, sits two desks from me. Uh, so I didn't want to say anything bad about it. Actually, I, I think that, that it is probably the best tool out there if you have to write straddling code. And straddling code is almost always a necessary stepping stone towards Python 3. This is another thing that that I didn't know when we were planning Python 3. We, we sort of, we actually, we, we thought about a development process, how you would take Python 2 code and turn it into Python 3 code. And in, in, in that carefully thought out plan of how you would do it, there was no stage where you had straddling code. Because our original opinion was that the small syntactic Differences between two and three were so so key that sort of the the set of possible programs that were both valid Python two and valid Python three syntactically and also were correct in both languages was vanishingly small. Well, maybe it was was small, but that is the only way that people in practice manage to move sort of Python 2 code to Python 3. And, and so I, 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 I did not anticipate that. Uh, I am now with the program, and I think that sort of you have to do straddling code. I mean, if, if you have users, sure. If, if it's your code and you're the only user, just sort of one day sit down, turn it all into Python 3 and never look back. Uh, on the other hand, as soon as you have users who also write code that integrates with your code, uh, you have to sort of plan it very carefully and get the users in the loop and tell them what to expect and ask them when they can sort of, when they can transition and you have to sort of work with carrots and sticks and uh, tools and linters and six is an essential part of sort of making straddling code possible. So I figure we should have one question about the first part of your talk. Um, your description of yourself as a child kind of reminds me of my own son, even though he's a few years younger than you yet. Um, what things, looking back on what your, how your parents raised you, what things did they do that helped you and didn't help you become the person you are? And, one thing that, that I am incredibly grateful for is that my parents gave me sort of complete freedom to decide my own path. Many of the, the kids I knew at the time had a very different situation. Their parents were, I don't know, something important in banking and it was totally obvious that the son was going to become a lawyer and, and then probably also an important businessman or manager. Uh, I knew someone whose dad was a political activist and his path was already determined he was going to become a political scientist himself. And in my family, there was very little of that kind of predisposition. 
There was, was no expectation. There was never any sort of pushing in a particular direction. I mean, there were much subtler si signals. My, my dad didn't like organized sports. Uh, I sort of happen to also not like organized sports. <laughs> On the other hand, my wife and son are <laughs> very differently inclined. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the, the sort of, there was lots of discussion, but there was, there was not a whole lot of direction. I remember at some point my brother decided that he wanted to be sort of not very ambitious, and he didn't want to work hard at school, and my dad had to swallow a bit, and then he said, okay, sure. And it worked out fine. Uh, may I ask one question about uh, uh, Pi 3.6 yeah. uh, of the F string? Mm -hmm. uh, I found it's very powerful, but you know it doesn't allow the, uh, the, the common side. So you cannot put a, like a comments in between. I mean, for literal string, it's okay, but if you, if you can, you want to evaluate something there, and if you want to say you want to generate some like framework code or whatever, you want to evaluate a string. Inside, I know it's a bad practice, but just for fun, and <laughs> you know, and in that case, I mean, sometimes it, it it works in the normal string, but once you have a eval over there, it just fail. You know, what kind of reason behind that? the the <coughs> It sounds like you've actually read the PEP because I don't think I, I clarified that here, right? Yeah. You, you haven't. Play with it, so. You played with it? Yeah, I mean, someone, someone just like a okay. Ha. Yeah, so the, there actually a lot of thought went into that because we were very worried and, and some people were extremely worried that we would invent a new mechanism that would be inherently insecure. Uh, and so we, we intentionally picked, uh, we, we designed a feature so that it is useless with eval. Or at, at least it, it, doesn't any, it doesn't do any eval itself. So the, the F string must be a literal and it, so it, it must be a literal in your code. Let me see what's, what's the right way to think about this. If you, if you use any of these forms, especially take the form that with the star star locals, that one actually, if instead of a string literal here, you had a string that you received through a web form, the person typing the data in the web form or probably feeding it to some kind of uh, fuzzer uh, or sending it to you using their own web client, they could send you a format string that would print out any local variable in, in your scope uh, and possibly even sort of anything that is, is referenced from any of the local variables. And they could probably find all kinds of secrets that a web application should not reveal to its end users. So this, this sort of the F string only works when you have a literal in your code because the idea is someone who is feeding you, you data through, say, an HTTP connection cannot feed you a line of code that you will just execute. So they cannot send you, there's no way for someone to send you an F string containing an expression that they made up, which then is executed in your program to tell them something that is, is possible. Like su suppose they could send you an F string and an arbitrary expression could be in there. That expression could be a function call and that function call could be like os.system 
uh, with RM star in it or something insane. Or, well, you sort of let, let your imagination go wild. The whole design of the F string is to sort of to enforce it that that kind of loophole is impossible to, to sort of accidentally have in your program when you're using F strings. I mean, if the, the, it's still possible to write a program that reads an F string from, from input, but that program will always have to contain an exec or an eval call. And the exec or eval call is the, the insecure thing, not the F string that, that it might contain. So I, I don't know if that's a completely satisfactory answer to what you were, were asking, but. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're out of questions. Thanks, everybody. Glenn, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming. All right, always fun. Um, so we're out of time. We're actually 15 minutes over. We're already supposed to have left, but I just didn't want to stop because we're too good. So um, on this side of the room, we're going to quickly say for hiring and those who are looking for you. So we just kind of